Really? Not really. I can't start all over, it's too embarrassing. Today I'm gonna to talk about the Battle of Uhud, okay? Did you know that? <laughs> so, the first thing, they wanna get revenge for what happened to them at Badr. So they want a second battle and they wanna get revenge for all their losses suffered at Badr. The second thing, they want to affirm their position amongst the Arabs, their power, their control. They suffered a defeat, you leave it at that, it's embarrassing. So they want to put their, get, regain their position of power amongst the Arabs. And they also wanted to end the threat to their caravans. How did Badr start? Remember, it was the Muslims trying to intercept the caravan of the Quraysh. So they want, because, and, and as you know, from the Quran, the Quraysh, they used to have the two trips, Rahlat al-Shita'i was Saif. Their, their caravan trips for business and trade to Yemen and to Syria. I saw one estimate, I don't know how accurate it is, but I saw one estimate that these caravans would make 250,000 dinars from these trips. That's like a quarter of a million gold coins. Dinars are gold. Imagine that amount of money for a relatively, by comparison, a relatively small city. That's a lot of wealth. And if this is under threat, then this is gonna be a huge problem for them. But wait a minute, we just had one attempt, didn't we? At the, car on the caravan, that's Badr, that resulted in the Battle of Badr. But no, there was actually another one. So what happened is the Quraysh, they decided on a different route, okay? Because the old one passes near Medina, the Muslims can intercept it, so they, want, they don't wanna repeat that same issue. So they came up with another way, and it was top secret, and just a few people knew about it. But from amongst the people who knew about it was a, name, a man by the name of Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud. Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud, he was from the Quraysh. He knew the secret passage of the caravans. And he was a non-Muslim. He had a Muslim friend. His Muslim friend was Sulayt. And the two of them were drinking together. And of course, you guessed it. This is before drinking was completely forbidden. This is back when you could drink but don't pray when you're drunk those days, right? So they started drinking and Nu'aym, the guy who knows the secret route, started drinking and he got drunk, you know, and started telling everything. He told him the amount of wealth that's gonna be on the caravan. He said this, it, it will be carrying 100,000 silver dirhams. It, is, it will have this many camels. It has this kind of merchandise on it and Sulayt, and just listening carefully. He said, aha, okay, great. The minute they were done, he immediately went and he got the news to the Prophet وسلم, who immediately set up a, a group of uh, warriors and they went out and they captured this caravan. So now, yes, there is a threat to their trade routes and so they, this is one of the reasons why the Battle of Uhud took place. The Mushrikeen after Uhud they used all the money from the caravan that was saved to invest it into the Battle of Uhud. I mean, and Abu Sufyan, you know, he was in charge of it and he knew this person is getting this much, this person is getting that much. So they made sure that everybody put all that money towards equipping the army of Uhud. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentions this incident in Surah Al-Anfal. Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا those who disbelieve, they spend their wealth so they can take people away from the path of Allah Azza Then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says that this money, this wealth is going to come back and cause them grief and they will be defeated. But what's interesting, this verse was revealed way before Uhud. This is Surah Al-Anfar and it was revealed after like the Battle of Badr. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is telling us, what is going to happen, and it exactly happened. So they put a lot of money into preparing these armies. What do they have? What's the result? They've got 3,000 soldiers, 3,000. 200 horsemen, and the horsemen back then in warfare was a big deal. It's like having a tank on, on the battlefield next to a foot soldier. So the, the horse was like a tank back then. So they, they had 200 horsemen, 3,000 in total, they got help from the tribes of Kenana and Tehama and even the Habish. 
the Habish, this was a, a huge tribe and a powerful tribe, but it was composed of freed slaves over the years. They would go and they would settle in this area until they grew and grew and grew and they become, became powerful and they had a powerful army. Even the Habish contributed to the army. They had 3,000 camels, and camels are not just riding. If you have an army this big, they have to eat every day. They slaughter a number of these. So they had 3,000 with them, 3,000 camels. And 700 mailed soldiers, you know, meaning male armor. And this is one of the things, you know, you watch the movie The Message, and they're just going out in thobes into battle. No, they used to wear armor. And sometimes you, they couldn't recognize each other because they're covered sometimes head to toe in armor. So 700 of these 3,000 soldiers were wearing armor. And uh, uh, the right flank of the army was under the leadership of Khalid ibn Walid with his horsemen. He wasn't Muslim back then. And the left flank was under the leadership of Akrima ibn Abi Jah. And some women came as well. So under the leadership of Hind bint Utba, who is the wife of Abu Sufyan. There are, there are any narrations go anywhere from eight to as high as 15 women came out to cheer on and encourage the men to fight bravely. So, the, and Hind, you know, she has a vested interest because in Badr, her father, her brother, and her, her son, all three were killed. So she wants to make sure that they avenge their death. And they would get poets to go out and to visit tribes and to recite verses of poetry, encouraging people to come and join the army. So at this point, because at Badr, the majority of the leaders died of the Quraysh. So who do we have now? We have Ikra ibn Abi Jahl is one of the leaders. We have Abu Sufyan, Sakhar ibn Harb. We have uh, uh, Abu Sufyan, we have Safwan ibn Umayyah. And we have Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah. These are like the four leaders of the Quraysh. Now, we all know about this narration where the Prophet ﷺ, he saw a dream where there, there's going to be, basically he interprets it as that there will be killing amongst his companions. So 70 cows killed and uh, his sword broke. So he interpreted that the 70 cows that will be 70 of his companions will be killed. And then the, the sword breaking will be a family member of his dying. In Sahih Bukhari, this narration, it, it says that the Prophet ﷺ saw this dream after Uhud, after the Battle of Uhud. Even though you might have read in Sira books that the Prophet ﷺ saw this dream before. Allah Azza knows best. But he consulted his companions. He wanted to meet the Quraysh in the city of Medina. They know it better. They know their streets, pathways. The women and even children can assist. They can throw rocks and things at the other army from the rooftops. But there were a number, and it was primarily the young companions, they wanted to go out. They, first of all, a group of them, they missed out on Badr. Because, like I said, Badr wasn't supposed to be a battle. It was just a group of men who were going to intercept a caravan that was only guarded by 60 people. So they didn't really prepare heavy like, war, uh, like uh, weapons and they didn't prepare heavy armor. It's just simple. 300 men are going to intercept 60 and take the caravan. Then it became a battle. So many people didn't go out. And those people were just yani, upset that this is the first battle in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and I missed it. And you know, Badr is a big deal. You, many times you're reading about a companion and it'll say he was a Badri. Yani he, he was one of the people who attended Badr. <coughs> Not only that, it's a big deal in the heavens. You know that narration when Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, how do you regard those of, from the companions, from the Muslims who witnessed Badr? Rasulullah said there, we regard them as of the best amongst us. He said the angels who witnessed Badr, same thing. Yeah, and even in the heavens, angels who attended Badr were a big deal. So, so they were upset. We missed out on this opportunity. And now we're going to meet them in the city behind the doors and roads. And so they were anxious and they kept saying, we'll meet them outside. And it was braver also to meet them outside. We don't want to meet them in the city. The older companions, more experienced companions, they agreed with the Prophet ﷺ to meet them. 
in the city. And that's what happens later on, right? The Battle of Al Khandaq. The Battle of Al Khandaq, we met, they met them in the city. So the older companions agreed, the young ones, the people who missed out on Badr were pushing hard to go out and meet them in battle. And even the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, agreed with the Prophet ﷺ. Partially because he doesn't want to go out and fight anyways. Second, though, despite being a hypocrite and everything, he was a very experienced, yeah, and he was a seasoned war veteran, he was an experienced um, soldier. So he knew it's best to meet them in the city. Anyways, so what happened now? You have the examples, like someone like another ibn al-Harith, he was so upset that he missed the first battle with the Prophet ﷺ. So he said, if I get another opportunity to fight with the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allah will see what I'll, what I'll do. Allah will see what I'll do. So now the city is in a state of high alert. And what some narration said, they even prayed in their armor. In the masjid, they were wearing the armor. And the next day, so the Prophet just gets the news. And this is, by the way, happened on Friday. Prophet gets the news. It happens to be the day of Friday. So people are gathered already in the masjid. And the Prophet tells them, and this is when they decided we'll go and meet them. We'll go outside of the city and meet them. Then the Prophet goes home. And he puts on two coats of armor, not one. And, and he put it on as a lesson. As a lesson for his companions to understand and also for us to understand. Because realistically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the Prophet وسلم, that he's going to protect him from people. Right? See, and that's how the Prophet is different from us. Allah, if, yani, if I got a promise like that from Allah, I'll go to battle in, in shorts. Only. <laughs> no socks even. Bas kida, huh? Come, ta, shoot, shoot, shoot. Because khalas, Allah said you're never going to get hurt. But the Prophet is teaching us the, about the means and taking precaution. And so he wore two coats of armor. Then the companions regretted. The older companions like reprimanded those who said, let's go out and kept pushing. They knew the Prophet didn't want to go out and they kept pushing. So then everyone felt regret. So when they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they told him that, you know what, we'll meet them in the city after he already got dressed for war, he says, it is not appropriate for a Prophet of Allah that once he puts on his armor, he takes it off. Done. Halas. So it, it is not flip-flopping, wishy-washy, accused of being, uh, you know, cowardice, whatever. Halas. And so I put it on, that's it. It's not coming off again. So... They head out. Now, remember, this was Jumu'ah, the consultation. And in no time, they're at Uhud. Because Uhud is not really far from, uh, from Medina. So they say, uh, how far is it? It's about, th the, Uhud itself is about three kilometers outside of uh, Medina. I'm going to use kilometers just because they're smarter. That's the only reason. There's about three kilometers outside of uh, the city of Medina. They say the human being walks about at the speed of six to seven kilometers per hour. So in a half an hour, you can be there. And an Uhud itself is 23 kilometers long and it is three kilometers wide. Now, uh, realistically, I know we always call it the mountain of Uhud, but it's, it's really a mountain range. So people think the mountain range has to be something huge like the mountain. Appalachian or the Rocky Mountains, it doesn't have to be. So what's the definition of a mountain range? It's basically a, a group of uh, mountain peaks that are connected at the base w at uh, above ground level, and, uh, well above ground level. So meaning you will have a, a bunch of these next to each other. They're not connected at, l at ground level, but they have a base that's really high up, and then you see a peak over here, a peak over there, and over there. That's a mountain range. So it's really a mountain range. But one, one lump called a mountain, and, and I don't know that in Arabic at that time, they had a distinction between mountain range and mountain. Just like in Arabic, al-Bahr is a sea or an ocean or any large body of water. They didn't have this. It was not specific. Anyways, so the Prophet ﷺ leaves very same day, and he puts Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the companion of Abdullah Anhu, as you know, the blind companion, Abu Sawatawalla famous, 
he puts him in charge. And this is not the first time or the last time that he puts him in charge of a city when he leaves. He's in charge of, he's in charge of the Salah. He's also the one who used to make the second Adhan of Fajr. So now the Prophet has broken up his army into three regiments. You have Mus'ab ibn Umair, and then when he gets killed, Ali ibn Abi Talib takes over after him. He's in charge of the regiment of the Muhajireen. You have Usaid ibn Hudayr, he's in charge of Al Aws. And then Al Khazraj is under the leadership of Al Hubab ibn Al Mundhir. So these are the three. What is, what is the size of the Muslim army? Remember the Quraysh, 3,000 with 700 males and 200 horsemen and lots of food. Here, maximum, we're 1,000. 1,000 soldiers and 100 of them ha are male, Yani Only 100 out of the 1,000 have armor. And there's a, a small number of horses, a small number of camels. No comparison between the preparedness and the equipment of the Muslim army versus that of the Quraysh. Not only that, so we're a thousand now, but then the army proceeds a little bit and the hypocrites break off. About 300 of them. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he says, suddenly, and you know when someone just wants an excuse, right? And Taib you left the city with 300 of your people. Then suddenly they get to this point, he's like, we're going back. What's going on? Well, first of all, I'm offended that uh, the Prophet ﷺ took the opinion of the young companions and left my opinion and that of the others of staying in Medina. But you knew that when you got to this point. Why did you come all the way here to realize you didn't take my opinion? You didn't know that? Just an excuse, right? Then the other excuse that Allah mentions in the Quran, he says, they're not gonna fight anyways. If, if there really was gonna be fighting, we would come. But we know there's not gonna be any fight. And of course, these are just the excuses, right? And that's why in, in Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives such a powerful response for the, the hypocrites when they come and give their excuses. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his prophet to tell them, ta'atun ma'rufa, yani ta'atun ma'rufa means we, you know the type of obedience that's required of you. So you don't need to come and talk because they would come وَأَقْسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَإِنْ أَمَرْتَهُمْ لَيَخْرُجُنْ They would come to the Prophet ﷺ. And you tell me, only a hypocrite would behave like this. يعني, the hypocrite would come, Ya Rasulullah. This is before jihad and all that. If you ever ask us to go out for jihad, وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ you will find me in the front lines. Um, swear a big oath, the strongest oath, that if you command us, you will, we will find us there. Right. <laughs> now, is there any narration where Abu Bakr came to the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, if there's ever a battle, Wallahi, you will find me in the front. Khalas, we know you're honest, you, you're truthful, you're sincere, so we don't need your explanation. And you don't need to swear by Allah. So a lot of times, you know, the guy starts to swear to you, oh, this guy's a liar. I will lie, brother. I, I, I am not lying. I will lie, brother. I never accuse you of lying, but you keep swearing by Allah. Now I think you're a liar. You should have stayed quiet. So, uh, Allah says, their answer, don't, don't swear an oath. Which the Mufassirin said, one, it means, you know the obedience is required of you. So why are you coming to swear an oath to me that you will, you know what's required. And then the other tafsir says, we know the type of obedience you have. Ta'atun ma'rufa. We know your obedience. Don't swear. We got you. We understand. Halas is known. So, so it's just, that's what it is. So they break off. 300 people break off from the army that was already a third smaller than the army of the Quraysh. And when they broke off, the Muslim army broke into two groups. One group said, let's fight them right now. Forget the, the Meccans. These are the problem. Let's fight them. And the other group said, let's forget them. Let's just move on to, to the battlefield. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer, refers to this also in the Quran. فَمَا لَكُمْ فِي الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِئَتَيْنِ Why are you in two different positions or two groups concerning the hypocrites? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just got rid of them and sent them back. But they, when they decided to turn back, they even shook the morale and affected the hearts of other people. So Bani Salama, 
uh, Banu Salama and Banu Haritha both almost they started wavering and they start considering going back, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept them firm. Abdullah ibn Haram would go out and tell them yeah, to speak to the hypocrites. It's 300, and he was telling them to fear Allah, to not do this, and they insisted. So they left. So now our army is 700, composed of 700 soldiers. And now the Prophet also inspects the army, and he takes the youth out of the army, the ones that are too young. From the famous ones, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, he's taken out. He's about 11. And others who are like 11, 12, too small, they took them out of the army. But I always say there's, there's something to think about here. Why would an 11-year-old be in the army? Like, why would he think, I'm so capable, I can join all these huge grown men and take them, you know, and join them. And I, I really do believe this, that that was a society that didn't treat them as little kids. And that's why they felt capable. And today, something like that, you'd never find an 11-year-old thinking he can do what the adults can do because, you know, he's just a little boy, you know, this is dangerous and all that stuff where we, we put, we fluff them up with pillows and ice cream and cotton candy. Yeah, nah. The concept of raising like lions doesn't exist. You say that, people are like, lions? Even my wife doesn't get it. Is she here? She's busy. She doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. Like, yeah, lions, you know? Mafi, mafi. So, so basically, they felt they were in a society that made them feel capable. On that note, let me say this quickly. Like, in Islam, there isn't the concept of, or the word, kid. You know, you'll call an 11-year-old, hey, kid, come here. So in Islam, we have children, then we have young men and young women. So always, you see, 11-year-old, 9-year-old, time, young man, ta'ad. Hey, kid. You know, and forgive me if I've said this before, okay? But originally, the word kid in English is a, was a derogatory term, was, okay? But don't be one of those people that keep going back to the history. I refuse to use the word, it, it changed. That's how language works. Yani, uh, side note, one time we had this sheikh just come visit our center in Virginia. So one of the brothers said, uh, we are fortunate to have with us sheikh so-and-so. Sheikh says, no. Fortunate comes from the word fortuna, which was the goddess of luck. The brother didn't mean that. That's the origin of the word. He didn't mean, thank you, fortuna, for sending us Sheikh Abdul Halim. Uh, he didn't mean that. But sometimes people get into the. So the word kid is not derogatory anymore. But what is a kid in English? What's a kid in English? Baby goat, right? And that's why when someone was a troublemaker in America in the, in the old days, they called him blank the kid. Can you think of one? Billy the kid. Why do they call him the kid? Because he's a troublemaker. Because kids, baby goats, they're running around and, and eating and destroying and, and headbutting people and stuff. So initially it was a derogatory term. Doesn't mean that anymore. But the point is that we have young men, we have, we have children. And these young men were treated like men by the society, so they felt they were capable, so they joined the army. So the Prophet took all the little ones out. Then he took out Rafa ibn Khadij. And, and of course, he wants to be in the army. He wants to be and go to battle. He knows it's dangerous, so he wants to go to battle. So he, he argues. He says, I'm an excellent marksman. I never miss. So why should I not join? I'm very good with this, probably better than some of these adults. So the Prophet ﷺ allows him to join the army. But then, <laughs> Samur ibn Jundub, who was his buddy, another young man, that didn't make sense to him either. He was not a good marksman. But he argued, he says, how is he about allowed to stay? And I'm stronger than him. I always beat him in wrestling. So how is the guy weaker than me staying and I go home? One narration says the, the Prophet let them wrestle and then he allowed the two of them to stay behind. Okay. Now, again, this is, uh, I guess I have to say this in case somebody's like, oh my God, they're little children and we should be home coloring watermelons in and using their coloring book and the Prophet sent them out to battle. Yeah, this is what they call presentism is when you use the values of present day 
and then go back a thousand years in time and say, how come they didn't have the same values? Yeah, okay. And Muhim, the point is. So, uh, this now, we're, uh, the Prophet ﷺ gets to the battlefield. And now this is where it gets very strate strategic. So, he just came from, let's say Medina is that way. He just came from Medina, and this wall is Uhud, all right? So, he comes now and turns his back to the Mount of Uhud, facing Medina where he just came from. Because he's picking the most strategic position. You don't want your back to be uncovered. So an, a group or a regiment can circle behind you or encircle you. So you want your backs to be protected. So the way, and when, inshallah, those of you, who, when we go in November, you will see the spot where the Prophet ﷺ camped. So the mountain of Uhud turns a little bit. So there is mountain on this side and then mountain behind and the open area is in front. So the army has to meet us in front. But there's more genius here. There is a, a mountain, a small little mountain or hillock now called Jabal. Now today we call it Jabal al-Rumat. And back then it was called Jabal Aynain, right? I believe it was Aynain, yeah? Yep, Jab Jabal Aynain. So some of you who have visited, you saw it. It's a small hillock that people get up and they just look at it and stuff. The, Historians, scholars believe that it was three times bigger back then. But it's 1,400 years of people climbing up and climbing down. And maybe some guy takes something in his pocket for later or when they get sick or some nonsense, right? So, so now the only open area from the left is between the mountain of Uhud here and this little hill that's separated by itself here, which is known as Jabal al-Rumat today. The only area where someone could encircle and come behind them is this opening right here. So the Prophet ﷺ took 50 of the best archers and he put them on top of that mount. And he gave them very explicit and specific instructions. And he will tell them that if you, if you see us, we have defeated the enemy. And we start tr yani, st trampling them, stepping over them. Don't join us. If we see, if you see that we've been defeated and the birds are coming in and eating our flesh, I and mean, we're dead, don't join, do not leave this position of yours. Just stay here, do not leave no matter what. The 50 archers. And this will prevent any, any contingency or, or, or regiment or any group trying to come and make a circle around, pass between this Jabal al-Rumat and Uhud and come and attack the Muslims from behind. So these 50 stay there. He says, if they come and try to come from this gap, you shower them with arrows. All right. So that, that's taken care of. Clear, explicit instructions there. Now, then we've got the encouragement of the Prophet ﷺ. And he's encouraging his men. And of course, believers like this, you encourage them with Al-Jannah. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ told them about Al-Jannah. And then he did something different. He took a sword his sword, and he said, Man saif Who will take this sword and with its rights? Yani give it its due rights. Now look at these narrations. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Lion of Allah. The narration says, everyone starts saying, Ana, 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 I will, I will, I will. Everybody wants the sword of the Prophet Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib said, I'll take it. Prophet didn't give it to him. You know the Quraysh, they were asked, they said, who gave you the hardest time at Badr? They said it was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Monster. Couldn't handle him. Prophet wouldn't give it to him. Ali ibn Abi Talib. They used to say, La fata illa Ali. There's no young man except for Ali. Yani it's like he's the man. And the Prophet said, no. Al Zubair ibn al Awam. Prophet said, no. Al Maqdad ibn al Asad. Al Maqdad ibn Aswad, he was him and Al Zubair. They used to equal a thousand warriors. Later on in battle, they consider them to equal a thousand by themselves. And, he, and they didn't get it. So who's going to get this sword if these warriors don't get it? So then, I'm just mixing narrations together. One narration, a man says, Ya Rasulullah, wa ma haqqahu, haqqahu, and what is the right of this sword? And some scholars said it's as if the Prophet wanted that question first. Like, who will take this sword and give it its rights? Yes, I will, but you didn't let me tell you what the rights were. Okay? 
We'll go with that narration. And the Prophet says, That you strike the enemy with it until it bends. That's the right of this sword. Yeah, and you fight like crazy, you fight till the death. And so, a man by the name of Abu Dujana, Samak ibn Kharasha, he said, I will take the sword. And the Prophet gave it to him. This was like a big, big honor. But he was no joke. He was, he was a furious, fierce warrior. And he used to have a red hand headband kit that he would put it on. And they called it Asamatul Mot, the, the, the red band of death. If he put it on, that means he's either going to fight to the death or become victorious. You know? So in modern reference, kind of like when Rambo put the red thing on. <laughs> now some of you, oh, Rambo, okay, Rambo. Now I get it. Though. Rambo, Rambo, that's it. Yeah, he put it on like this. And then he started to walk around in front of the, like the army can see him. They couldn't, they, they're all, you know, can, uh, within seeing distance. So he starts to walk in a very arrogant way, kid, a pompous showing his chest and stomping his feet. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this walk, Allah, that Allah hates, except in this situation. You're showing your strength and your power. Allah would hate for anyone to walk like that. Except in a situation like this, you're trying to show your power in front of the enemy, maybe break their spirits a little bit. Today people walk like that, kid of us, without... <laughs> they put a suit on, like, oh, nobody gave you a sword. Well, your pocket has a chiclet gum in it. <laughs> what are you trying to do here? You're embarrassing all of us. <laughs> so... So this is Abu Dujana. So he took it and he saw, and he starts to recite lines of poetry. He said, I am the one that my close, yeah, my dear beloved, my Khalil, made a ahd, a covenant and a deal with me while we were at the Asafhi, the plateau with date palms in it. Asafhi ladan nakhili. That I will not spend all eternity in Al-Kayul. Al-Kayul are the last rows of battle. These are Al-Kayul. I don't find the heroes in the, in the last rows of battle. All right. So he said that I will not spend all eternity, and a long time in the back rows. Uh, what's going on here? This is not the battery. Aywa. But he said that I will not spend all eternity or a long time in the back rows. But I strike with the sword of Allah and his messenger. So, okay, here we go. Now, the Meccan army is in rows. Abu Sufyan is in charge in, in, of, of certain regiments. On the right, we said Khalid bin Walid. On the left, Ikram bin Abi Jahl. We've got Safwan ibn Umayyah, he's in charge of the infantry. And Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah, he's in charge of the archers for the army of the Quraysh. And the standard, now what is the standard? So as you know, the standard is, is a flag basically. It's a long flagpole and you have to hold it in battle. Why do I need to hold the flag in the middle of battle? Yeah, the people, swords are swinging and I'm holding a flag. Careful, yes, I'm a man. Right? What do you do with Why are you holding a flag in the middle of battle? So it's called the standard, right? Araya. And the standards are very important in battle. First of all, these battles were fierce and they were chaotic. And you get turned around so many times. And if you're fighting in flat desert, like which one is my arm? You turn around four or five times. Which way did we? Where are we? Aslan? Where, is, where are my people? How do I reconvene and, or regroup with my folks, my army? How do I find them? You look up and you see your flag, your standard. So the standard bearer then was sought after. The other army is trying to knock the standard down because when the standard doesn't come up again, the battle's over. So the standard bearer also had to be a hero because everybody wants them and they hold it with one hand and fight like a hero with the other hand. So this is a big deal. So. The standard of the Quraysh was always with Bani Abdiddar, this tribe of Bani Abdiddar. They inherited 
from their ancestor, Qusay ibn Kilab. And from then on, every battle, they're the ones who hold the standard. And at Badr, they did a bad job. They dropped it. They lost the battle. And you're going you're gonna to blame the standard bearers and the group in charge of protecting the standard. You dropped it. We lost the battle. Our army separated and dispersed. So Abu Sufyan now, he wants, he's going to use reverse psychology on them. Meaning he's going to tell them, do a good job, but it's not in that nice way. He came to them. He said, Ya Bani Abdiddar. He says, you know the importance and the position of the standard. And you know what happened at Badr. So if you guys can't handle it, let us know. And we will take care of it. Very insulting, right? Like we're stronger than you. You feel you're not up to the challenge. It's okay. You can fail. That's the stuff they tell you at school now, right? It's okay to fail. <laughs> it is okay to fail. It's not okay to talk to somebody like that. All right? So, <laughs> oh, so what happens? They got so mad. They got so mad at him that they threatened him. And I let, no, he said, you're going to see what kind of job we're going to do. But they even in some narrations, they threatened him. They'll hurt him if he you know, doubts them. So now he did, he got what he wanted. He riled them up and they're going to hold on to that standard hard. They're not, not, not going to let it drop. Now they start, the Quraysh start to play mind games. They want to get the Ansar to leave. Because they don't care about the Ansar. They care about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They care about those Muslims from Mecca, the, the Muhajireen who left, their, their kinsmen basically, who left and went and settled in Medina. So they came and they said to the Ansar, to the Aus al Khazari, they said, listen, we don't have any problem with you. Just stand aside and let us deal with our cousins. But of course, the Ansar, they're not the kind of people that, no way, no way this is going to be appealing to them. So they completely refused. So then this man, by the name of Abu Amir, and this man, Abdu, uh, Abu Amr, his name was Abd Amr ibn Saifi. And his, they call him Abu Amr. And he was, uh, they were about to make him the king of Medina. And when the Prophet ﷺ came, they scrapped that plan because everyone started becoming Muslim. So he is very angry at Islam because he lost his potential kingdom. He was going to be the king. So, but they used to love him a lot, this guy. They used to love him a lot. Now when Islam came, he went, he moved to Syria. And when the news of Uhud and the battle came, he came back just to join the battle. And he, of course, still living off the old memories of how his people revered him and listened to him and everything. So he says, listen to me. These are my people and they love me very much. Watch, I'm going to talk to them and they're going to give us the people that we want. They're going to step, step aside. So he comes out to them. And he says, O oh people, I am Abu Amir. They thought, oh, Abu Amir, I am the Habibi. No, no, no. They're like, Fala an'am Allahu bika aynan ya fasiq. <laughs> they said, No eye is pleased by ever seeing you, you fasiq, you, dis you dissolute. Because the Prophet, they used to call him Abu Amir al Rahib, the monk. And the Prophet renamed him to Al Fasiq, someone who's always disobeying Allah. So he thought they're going to be like, oh my goodness, it's him. They said, yeah, no one, no eye is pleased by seeing you, you dissolute. So he said, Laqad qawmi ba'di shar. My people have been afflicted by an evil after me. And what happened to them? They used to love me and everything. And now this is how they respond to me. So then <laughs> the battle starts. How does it start? We've got from Bani Abdiddar, Dar. Talha ibn Abi Talha, he's a standard bearer now for the Meccans. He, he challenges for a duel, to duel. And the man who steps out to him is Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so Talha here then takes his sword and he strikes at Ali radiallahu anh. So Ali radiallahu anh does something amazing. He blocks him with his shield. But he doesn't block with his shield and then the guy pulls his sword out and he swings again. So the minute he blocked, he struck him also. And he's, he's wearing heavy armor, but this lower part's kida uncovered. So he, as he blocked, struck him immediately, cut his leg off. The guy falls on the ground. And it's an embarrassing situation for everybody. He falls on the ground and falls backwards, and he is now uncovered. 
stuff nobody wants to see. Okay? He's uncovered and he's naked, kida, and he's crying and he starts begging for his life. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he's like, you're a warrior and you're like trash talking two seconds ago and now you're on the ground. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, let him. He let him live. He dies, of course, from his wounds and he couldn't join the battle, but he let him. They said, why did you leave him? He said, I wanted to... And he, he was in a dignified position. He's crying like this, and he's begging, and he's uncovered and naked and all that. So, Khali, this is not a, a dignified way to die. So he left him. We'll stop for the other, inshallah. So what do we have now? When Talha ibn Abi Talha, remember we said he was a standard bearer, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he struck him, so now the standard is down. So who picks it up? His brother, Uthman ibn Abi Talha. He picks up the standard. And then Halaz ibn Abdul Muttalib strikes this man in such a way. He strikes him at his shoulder. And the eyewitnesses said the sword, the blade kept going until it got to his navel. So he opened him in two parts, not half, but in two parts. And the eyewitnesses says, till we could see his lungs. And also a bit graphic, يعني, maybe there should have been a, a, a rating for this soon. I'm going to rate this right now. PG-8. <laughs> so we can have some lions. So he hit him like this, and they saw his lung jump like in the, in the cavity of his chest like that. So second guy falls. The battle just started, and already the standard fell twice. So now they launch a very powerful attack against Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. They push him back. And while they're focusing on pushing him back, Ali ibn Abi Talib goes around. They're not, ex they're not seeing, focusing on him. They're attacking one direction. He goes around, boom, hits the standard barrier, down for the third time so quickly. But things are happening all over the battlefield. So let's move, forward, move over to Khalid ibn Walid. He's going to make his first attempt with his horsemen to come between Uhud and Jabal al Ruma. So 200 of them, they're coming. And they're going to try to come in this space so they can encircle the army from behind. But the archers are there and the arrows are strong. And they're just showering them with arrow after arrow. And so they pull back. First attempt, failure. We've got Handala. He is known as Handala al-Ghasil. Also known as Ghasil al-Malaika. Handala, the one that was washed by the angels. And his name is actually Handala ibn Abu Amir. He is Abu Amr's son, the guy who <laughs> I thought he was loved. That's his son. And, and you just see how on the other side is the father, on this side is the son. And you see that the, the truthfulness and the sincerity and the dedication where people are fighting family members and it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Handala is known as Al Ghasil because he just got married. He just got married. And he was told that he heard the cry to join the army. So he goes immediately. He didn't even have time to make ghusl. And that's why when he was killed, the Prophet said, I saw the angels washing him. And that's why he's known as Hanbara al ghasil But also look at that. Like someone who's married, just married. Just married. And then they say, you could lose your life. Come join us. <laughs> la, la, la. There must be some kind of fatwa, Khan. I just got married. This poor girl, yani, if I die, who's going to... Come on, yani. <laughs> just went out. Didn't even wash. Man, these people were great. So he is killed by Shaddad uh, ibn al-Aswad, who killed him. And then later on is when the Prophet saw him being washed by the angels. There was one man who was heavily armored. And he was on top of a camel not a horse. He's heavily armored. He's on top of a camel. But with the camel, how do you strike someone with the sword? He had a long sword. And he was an expert at fighting with the long sword. So from the top of his camel, he's reaching people and he's killing them and they can't reach him. Camel's tall and it's high up there and the sword is not enough. They can't get him. They said he killed about nine people in the battlefield by himself. Now you have to remember, Nine is a huge number because, so sometimes people say, okay, look, yeah, look at Badr. It's 300 against 1,000 and 70 of the mushrikeen die. Just 70? You're considering the type of warfare. Yeah, 70 was a reasonable number. 
Because first of all, not every blow resulted in death. And now you, 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 know, you see these movies, you just strike him kidda, and then you kick him in slow motion, then he flies back dead. Strike the next one, kick him in slow motion, he flies back dead. لا حبيبي. Some blows, they're, they're blocked by the shield, by your sword, you miss, kidda يعني. So it's not just, then just meat everywhere when you're done, bodies all over the place. So for, for one man to kill nine in a battlefield, that's a big deal. And he's getting people and they're not able to get to him. So the Prophet ﷺ said, who will go out to this man? And nobody answered. Then the Prophet ﷺ asked again, who will go out to meet this man? And nobody answered. Then the Prophet ﷺ asked again, who will go out to meet this man? And Zubair ibn al-Awwam said, Ya Rasulullah, I'll go out to meet him. And the Prophet ﷺ, just so you know what kind of man and how courageous the Prophet ﷺ was, he said, Wallahi, if you, yeah, if you didn't volunteer, I would have gone out to him myself. So like if nobody goes, okay, khalas, let's pretend he's not there, I'll go. So as Zubair ibn al-Awam, he starts to study this man and study him carefully. Like what is the weakness here? How do I get him down with this long sword that is way on top of a camel? So basically he just prepped himself, he braced himself and he just ran top speed, jumped up in the air, grabbed him off the camel and brought him down to the ground and killed him there. Now, if you know what a camel, what it looks like when you're sitting on top of a camel and for you to jump high enough to grab someone and bring him off and he's a big guy and he's wearing armor and everything and to drop him off a camel, now you understand what kind of man we were dealing with here when we talk about his Zubair radiallahu anhu. So, so we've got heroics all over in different sides of the battlefield. Let's go to Abu Dujana, who was given the sword of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Zubair ibn al-Awam said, I got, I was angered and I was discouraged. And he went, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi I'm his relative. And he wouldn't give me the sword and he gave it to Abu Dujana. So I started to watch him to see what, how he behaved in the battlefield. He said he never came across someone except he destroyed that individual. Ka'b ibn Malik, he says, he says there was uh, this, this kafir and he was going around. He had one job in the battlefield. He would just find the wounded from the Muslims. He would finish them off. He said, so I was hoping that some Muslim would fight him. So then I saw this Muslim approach him. And this is in the battlefield now. They start to size each other up. Yeah, and you know, in the battlefield, there's understood that, okay, it's me and you. It's going to happen. Okay. So they're sizing each other up. He says, I'm looking at both of them. And I'm seeing that this kafir, he, he's better equipped. He's got better armor. He's got better weaponry. Now look at the Muslim. And then he says, then the Muslim hit him. Again, just like Hamza radiallahu at his shoulder. And it went all the way down to his hip. And he split the man in two. Not an equal house, but he came down in two pieces. So then, and, and remember, this is again to prove how they're so well covered. You can't tell who's whom. So he says, then the man removed the, his helmet. He looked at me, he said, what do you think, Cap? <laughs> oh my God, I love these moments. He just moved his helmet and he goes, what do you think, Cap? I'm Abu Dujan. And of course, what do you think? And Cap was amazed, blown away by him, right? So he says, then uh, I saw, this is not Cap, this is a Zubair, if I'm not mistaken. He said, I saw, no, actually someone else said, I saw Abu Dujana, and he's fighting people left and right. He says, then there was this one person that was making a lot of noise and encouraging the Quraysh so much. So I saw Abu Dujana about to chop that person in half. And then he stopped the sword in mid-blow above that person's head. He said when, when he came to strike that person, that person, Min al yeah, the ladies, that's that sound, you know, can't imitate it, but it, you know, Mahim, husbands love that sound, right? So she made that, she got scared, she's in battle, she made this sound, he stopped. The other narrator says, I saw Abu Dujana raise his sword and stop it over the parting of Hint. What is the parting where you part your hair? So if you've got two braids, you've got this, the parting where the hair splits. And he stopped the sword right over that area. And he says, I will not soil the sword of the Prophet with the blood of a woman. Yani, 
طبعاً. Now some sisters are like, oh, what's wrong with the role of a woman? No, it's an honor. يعني you don't attack a woman, it's respect. <laughs> we want to be equal in everything. Okay. So he's saying, I'm not going to dishonor the sword by attacking a woman who is helpless because she, in another narration, he said, she called out for assistance and she didn't get any. And I'm not going to kill a woman who, is, who is, doesn't have assistance, she's helpless. So he held back. But I'm talking about, look at this level of restraint. And could, yeah, you're in mid-swing and you pause. Most people just go with the momentum, say, astaghfirullah, later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are too serious. This is too exciting. So, <laughs> yeah, Zubair ibn Am is the one who witnessed that. And, and he said, he switched to, like, he would start to, when he would see someone, say, I hope Abu Dijana comes and fights this guy. Like, he became... You know, one of the fans of Abu Dujana, radiallahu anh. Seven minutes. Okay, now we go to another part of the ba battlefield. We've got Abu Talha. Not Talha ibn, ibn Ubaidillah. This is a companion by the name of Abu Talha. He had a shield made with leather. So not every shield was metal. Just thick, hardened leather. That was his shield. And he was a great marksman. And they described that he would shoot the arrow so violently, you know, like he would stretch it beyond what a normal person stretches it, shoots it fast, comes out with momentum. And, and he would stretch it out so much, Shani, that he broke three bows. Can you imagine to break a bow? So he broke three bow, bows that day. And so he would sh take a, an arrow and he would shoot it. And the Prophet was with him, making dua for him. And then he would shoot the arrow, then the Prophet ﷺ would put his head up to see if it hit or not. And then he would put his hand on the chest of the Prophet ﷺ and he would tell him that may my mother and father be sacrificed for you. Yeah, don't put your head up so that a stray arrow doesn't hit you. And he would tell him, Nahri duna nahrik, yani my death and not yours. Yani I would, if I die, it's okay, but you're the Rasul, you're, you're the Prophet of Allah. So he's shooting like this. And so the Prophet whenever he saw someone with arrows, he'd be like, bring it, bring it for Abu Talha. And he don't waste it. This guy is, this guy is great. <laughs> waste it somewhere else, bring it. <laughs> Let's go to Khalid ibn Walid. He's doing the, he's trying a second time to come between the mountain and Uhud. So he comes with his horsemen, but the, the archers are still there. They start showering them with so many arrows, they have no option but to retreat. In the meantime, we have uh, Musafir ibn Abi Talha. He is, they're all related to Abu Talha, right? Abu Talha is the first guy. Uthman ibn Abi Talha. Then we've got his sons. So now, this is uh, Musafir ibn Abi Talha, the fourth one to hold up the standard for Bani Abd al-Dar, the army of the Quraysh. And Asim ibn Thabit struck him, killed him. The standard falls. So then, his brother, Kilab ibn Talha, picks it up. And as Zubair ibn al-Awam strikes him, it falls. And this is happening quickly. So then his brother, al-Julas, he picks it up. And Asim hits him again. Now, way back at the camp of the Quraysh, there's a woman by the name of Sulafa. She is the mother of al-Julas, Kilab, the ones that just got, well, not Kilab, uh, Musafa. The ones that just got killed. And she's, of course, her sons, her husband, they're all by Abd al-Dar, they hold the standard. So every time she sees the standard falling, she knows someone from her family is being killed. So she asked one man, and they tell her that Asim killed this person. So every time she saw the, the standard fall, she thought it was Asim. Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. So she announced out loud, she said, who will bring me the head of Asim so I can drink wine on his, in his skull? And, if, and so she wants his head, and she said, I'll give a hundred camels. That's an incredible amount of wealth. So suddenly there is a severe attack. They're trying to get Asim, they're trying to get that reward. And then they launch another counter attack. Because there's, so the battle now is uh, intensified around the standard of the Quraysh. So they launch a counter attack now, they start to attack hard the standard of the Muslims. So kind of to offset that. 
So we have, but it's not working because then Ata ibn Shurahbi, seventh guy, picks up the standard, Ali ibn Abi Talib, knocks him down. They said, the narrator said either Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib or Ali ibn Abi Talib knocks him down. Then the ninth one, Amr ibn Abdi Manaf, picks it up. And the narrator says, I don't know who hit him. He drops. The, that was the eighth one. The ninth one, yeah, so the, the eighth one was Shuraih ibn al Qarib. And that's the one the narrator doesn't know who, who knocked him down. The ninth one is Amr ibn Abi ibn Abdi Manaf, and he picks it up. And then a man by the name of Quzman knocks him. It drops. The tenth person, one of the the sons of Shurahbir ibn Hashim, picks it up, and Quzman again knocks him down. So for the tenth time, it goes down. So. Uh, but then a, a slave, let's end at least, we'll end the, uh, we'll continue next time, but at least we'll end with the standard, what happens here. So the 10th time it fell down, then a slave of Bani Abdiddar, his name was Sawab. Sawab comes and he picks up the standard. So they strike and they said that it was either Ali, but most narrations say it was probably Quzman. They struck he struck his right hand. So you're holding the standard, struck his hand, he grabbed it with his left. They struck his hand, he grabbed it with his two forearms and he pushed it against his chest, held it like this. And he goes down on his knees and it so he can get a firm grip and more control. So he's down on his knees, he's holding it like this. And of course, he's not gonna last long. And, and look at the strength and the bravery. And he's just one of the slaves of Bani Abdiddar. Like, what do you have to do with this? The minute they start fighting, you should have just taken your water and left. <laughs> what are you waiting around for? Anyways, so, and so he drops to his knees like this and he yells out, Ya Bani Abdiddar, hal u'dhirt? Yani, he, basically he's saying, hey, have I been pardoned? Yani, did I do a good enough job? Did I do my part? Did I show enough bravery? You know, will you pardon me? Do I get the, you know, the okay? And then he drops, and now nobody wants to touch that stand. It fell 11 times, and it fell 11 times quickly. So now it falls for the last time, and it never goes up. And what happens when it never goes up? The battle's over. So the Meccans start scattering and running in every direction, trying to run back, get out of that battlefield. They are done. They lost. So if they lost and they're already running and leaving the battlefield, what happens that changes everything so much, so much so that the Muslims end up losing the battle? To find out, you will have to come next Friday, same time, inshallah. Zakum Lakhir for coming and listening attentively. Sallallahu Mubarak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.